थैंक यू तेजत जी थैंक यू जी सो आई स्टार्ट ऑलवेज रविंद्र सर मैम आस्किंग व्हाट इज योर फर्स्ट मेमोरी ऑफ इधर द वर्ड और द कांसेप्ट ऑफ अहिंसा फ्रॉम चाइल्डहुड आई डोंट नो आई डू नॉट एक्चुअली आई 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 डोंट थिंक आई हैव बट आई 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 रिमेंबर बट आई रिमेंबर टू थिंग्स वेरी वेरी क्लियरली so i i would have been um, eight or nine when we um, had a lovely man education here in kushan um and uh, strangely uh, in that little village town of anand um, you were growing up in anand i was growing up in anand going to school in the transport of five there were two yeah two or three things that we were required to do we were required to go and get from um petrol pumps crude used crude by which you could actually write slogans on the wall oh use it as paint as paint right because that was you know which, which was very difficult to remove easily available and in uh, now in, in retrospect i think it was also state property <laughs> there was no private crude at that point so one had to go and steal Uh, and then one had to go and write these slogans in Gujarati with reasonably good spellings on the wall. Two uh, sleep listlets into people's homes. Oh, what does the slogan say? Just, you know the usual kind. You know, kursi kali karo janta rahi hai, and even more colourful ones, which um, which were more abusive, uh, which gave us a lot of pleasure to 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 write about Chiman Bai and. Uh, about uh, then later when the emergency got imposed about Mrs. G, mm. um, and uh, that was also the time when people, um, the Sarvodaya people, um, were mobilizing themselves. Right? Sarvodaya people were mobilizing themselves, and they would come to the few houses in which they could actually come. Uh, so that was our first. Uh, that, that's my first memory of politics, really. I mean, in 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 a serious kind of way. Yeah. um not necessarily of non violence but of resistance mm-hmm. and i think that's very important yeah. uh that one um, understands the relationship between non violence and resistance yeah. and i think it's an inviolable relationship uh and um and it was it was it was you know it was a kind of resistance not that we, we were aware of it we were just being told as we were being told by elders or by by a college going friends or not even friends college going people say go do this do that but then one when one reflected on it one got a sense that this this is what's really happening hmm. Hmm. do you remember the slogan hamla chahe jaisa hoga was that uh, around in gujarat no no gujarat was you know um, um, since gujarat i mean gujarat went through uh, before anybody else gujarat went through the navnirman movement so the Uh, these were anti-corruption slogans, and mm-hmm. more particularly targeted at the person of the chief minister, Chief Minister Patel, yeah. uh, and 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 uh, for the kind of theft that he had committed. So it was mm-hmm. always about Chief Minister mm-hmm. uh, and and his story. That mm-hmm. so a lot of the slogans were about that. Yeah. The emergency slogans were also very different here because uh, by that time there was the Janata government, Babu Bhai Deshpande Patel was. the chief minister here mm. so uh, the kind of brand that gujarat had emergency mm. was very different mm. mm. you know gujarat was in fact mm. far more uh, open mm. at that point mm. Mm. Uh, strangely it it, it actually uh, was one of the states least affected by violence in that sense mm. Mm. it is so not a lesson then that. later on mm. as you were growing up or grown up Do you recall if and how you would have uh, dwelt on or learnt about non-violence? No, I, I think I learnt about violence, hmm. and um, and that's very important. Uh, we forget that our experiences of no, of violence are sometimes far more powerful than our experiences of non-violence. we have to meditate upon an experience and say this is an experience of non violence mm-hmm. the experience of violence is so visceral sometimes so mm-hmm. so overpowering mm-hmm. uh, we forget that a generation like mine which grew up in gujarat grew up amidst riots 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so my I mean, repeated I, riots, repeated riots, right? And and and, and my first riot, as I say, uh, is eighty three, right? and from eighty three, eighty four, eighty five, eighty six, eighty nine, ninety. And these riots were between whom? But these were, I mean, they began as caste riots. Some of them turned into communal riots. Then some were communal riots in which the caste dimension came to. To play. So there was anti-reservation riots which took place, then there were communal riots which took place, then that is really when the demobilization of the BJP started in a very powerful way, yeah. mid-1980s. So I have, you know, I grew up with, with a sense of uh, all pervasive uh, violence, not an everyday sense, mm-hmm. right? but um, um, for, for example when uh, 86 or 85, 86 riots uh, took place, uh, one would go to the hospitals and realize uh, that the, the the marks on the body of people who came uh, injured or, 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 or who, who later died were very different and one got speaking to the doctors as to how the technology of violence has changed. Right? Uh, so when you, when you see these things repeatedly, you, you begin to think of it in clinical terms as to between you know, let's say 1969, which is not what, what I saw, but, you know, 83 and 86, the technology changed. Between 86 and 92, the technology changed. Between 92 and 2002, the technology of inflicting pain, violence, taking life changed. So, um, uh, and then therefore, I have always maintained that one of our great failures and the great failures of those who speak of non-violence or, or, or wish to do non-violent politics has been that there's been no training in non-violence that we receive. While it is possible for me to go and get myself trained into acts of violence in use of arms, in use of uh, weaponry. And one structured example could be the army, but the non-structured examples are that there are a lot of um, no, non-military militia groups or non-military individuals who can who can be trained in the perpetration of violence while there has been not one training program uh, in how to be non-violent after the shanti sena collapse. after the shanti sena collapsed and i think that's been the great loss of the gandhian imagination can you say a bit here about uh, why you think the shanti sena idea and the mobilization disintegrated I don't know why, you know, we, we have all these things. I think the reason why it, you know, reason why the larger Gandhian imagination is disintegrated is that um, an imagination requires that there is a political, there is a politics around it. Right? And when the Gandhian politics oh, became uh, either ineffective, became in some ways um, subsidized, Mm-hmm. No, part of the Gandhian imagination. Subsidized or to ten? No, no, I think subsidized. Right? I mean, a large part of the Gandhian imagination was co opted by the state mm. and therefore came to be subsidized. A lot of the Gandhian institutions and activities came to be subsidized by the state, Khadi being a prime example. Right? Yeah. Uh, uh, but when, when you when you when you go too mm. close to the state, uh, you also become less and less political, mm. uh, more and more programmatic. So Gandhian imagination and activities became programmatic uh, rather than political. Mm. And one reason why you an activity such as or an organization such as Shanti Sena would become defunct is that no new people are joining the movement. Mm. If there is no movement, there is no recruitment. If there is no movement, there is no spread of imagination. Mm. If there is no movement, there is no young uh, people coming with completely different ideas or with uh, modes of doing things. Uh, uh, It's only when there is a movement that creativity and imagination comes to fore. And in absence of that movement, it became a kind of a formulaic thing. Today what we see around us happening, let's say on the the, uh, um, Citizenship Amendment uh, Act, Mm -hmm. uh, suddenly the young people are coming up with new forms. For example, humor. Okay. Humor as a means of political um, dialogue and discourse has been completely absent in our political life. 
even during the national movement, we were not humorous. We were everything, but we did not have political satire and humor. And this is a great thing. It could not have happened in absence of a movement. Yeah. Or, or the fact that, um, I mean, whoever thought that we would read the, uh, read the Constitution and, and the preamble, I mean, it's one of, um, suddenly it acquires a resonance that it had never had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine a period in our constitutional history where the preamble mm -hmm. or the words of the preamble had such resonance. It mm -hmm. has been with yeah. us for 70 years and more, yeah. right? but it had no resonance. So these things happen when there is a movement. Yeah. So I think the Gandhian imagination suffered. What about the JP movement then? In that sense that in Bihar at least, Hamla Chahe Jaisa Hoga Haat Hamara Nahi Hoothega was a, a very popular slogan and it has survived. Yeah, it has survived. But you also I think what we need to realize is that, um, you know, that was a very powerful movement. Right? Um, um, but um, it, it did not somehow become part of our mainstream political culture because those who came from the same movement became the biggest latheads of our political culture. I mean the three people who came out of it and joined the political movement or more uh, have had no love for violence, non-violence. Uh, so there was something in the movement which, which allowed a certain kind of an expression at a point but could not contain the political culture in the long duration. Mm -hmm. And the political culture then colored yeah. those who came from that movement in that thing. Yeah. 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 Was the early life experiences of that you were witness to so much violence in your childhood and youth, mm -hmm. did that in any way direct you towards scholarship of Gandhi? No, 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 no. I mean, I, I, I think this is a completely entirely different reason. And the reason is, is purely joy and literature. It's not, it was not politics. I, I grew up reading only one language, which was Kishwati, for a very large part of my life. Um, and when you read a certain kind of Gujarati of a certain period, um, you, you know, this, um, this man is ever present, uh, um, sometimes casting a shadow, but sometimes a very joyous presence. Uh, and so you begin to wonder as to why all the people that you like to read and all the people whose writing you admire or they, it gives you joy uh, are attracted to this person. So my, so I, I, I keep saying that I had the best introduction to M.K. Gandhi, which was through the world of poetry, literature, novels, and in Gujarati, in Gujarati and not through, uh, not through political texts or philosophical texts. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, and, and then, you know, as it happens when you, when you engage with him and you engage with him seriously, mm -hmm. it becomes, uh, Deeper and, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. did that draw you deeper into this question of violence and non-violence? It did, you know, because you, when, when, you, when you read Gandhi, uh, there is no way that you are not constantly among the perennial question, questions that he has, or the quest that he has, is the quest for non-violence, yes. uh, and um, and and you also realize that it is not only the quest for non-violence, but it's a quest for justice. Mm -hmm. Because he is, you know, for him, uh, uh, the idea that we need to be in a just world mm. uh, and that just world can be attained only through nonviolent means mm. or nonviolent means are also equally necessary to obtain that just world mm. is a kind of an inseparable thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, the question of nonviolence and more importantly, the question of the relationship between resistance and nonviolence mm. becomes important. Uh, uh, relationship between inequity and non-violence, so equity and non-violence becomes important. Yes. So those things have to be considered. You have written very eloquently about the incident where Gandhi agonizes about what to do with a very fatally ill calf. So could you recount that briefly and 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 tell us why you feel that episode is so important. No, I, I think you know. I, I think we reduce uh, we reduce the question of violence and non-violence to a bodily act. Mm -hmm. uh, but that uh, there is a deeper philosophical uh, stratum which inf 
informs Gandhi's thinking and Gandhi's action is something that we need to be aware about. We also need to be aware about the fact that Gandhi is a very complex thinker. Uh, you know, the Gandhi that is presented to us comes to us sometimes as an action person or comes to us as somebody who is uh, who's basically doing good and asking you not to have fun. Uh, uh, neither of which are true. Uh, uh, he is a very deep thinker and he is a very complex thinker and that incident when uh, uh, a calf is terminally ill at the Sabarmati Ashram in Ahmedabad and he gets uh, after a discussion uh, uh, an injection to be administered in his presence by a trained medical person to that calf and then writes about it. I think it's very telling. To put the calf out of his misery. Yeah, to calf out of its misery. Right? And then he says it is an act of love mm -hmm. and, and not just an act of love but it's an act of ahimsa. Mm -hmm. I think we need to unpack those layers of meaning because when is it ahimsa to take life? Mm -hmm. Because we've been always told mm -hmm. that ahimsa means non-injury. And, yes, right? but also it means uh, to uh, uh, not inflict avoidable suffering. Yes. Right? And here the issue is suffering. It's, it's suffering, right? And therefore, ahimsa becomes love. Yes. Right? So the relationship and, and therefore, I think what we forget uh, or we don't remember often enough is that uh, while uh, he uses the word non-violence, uh, in many instances for Ahimsa, in some very specific instances and in the, the instance of the Ashram and the Ashram community, uh, in, in a very small text called Ashram Observances in Action, Ahimsa is translated as love. It's a very, very subtle but very important difference. Uh, uh, of, of, of to, to reduce suffering and pain mm. is also an act of of, of, of Ahimsa. So, you know, so yeah. those instances I think are, yeah. are important to, to think of. Many people have felt very mm. puzzled about how Gandhi reads the Gita, mm. Bhagavad Gita, mm. and takes from it a message of Ahimsa. Mm. So, how do you read this part of Gandhi's life, his equation with the Bhagavad Gita? No, I think his equation with Bhagavad Gita is an extraordinary, extraordinary one. But I think it's not just the reading of the Gita. Mm -hmm. uh, when Gandhi reads, he reads in, in a, one of the most creative ways. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just give you one instance of that. Uh, the, the time when he's writing the autobiography is also the time when he's translating the Gita. Although it gets published much later, his Gujarati translation happens alongside the act of writing the autobiography. It's also the same time that he gives his discourses on the Gita at the, at the ashram and at the same time he, he wanted to give the discourses on the Bible at Gujarat Vidya which he is prevented from doing. I see. Right? Uh, during one of these discussions, uh, Gandhi is asked early morning, 4.20 in the morning, you can imagine what the setting would have been at the ashram, uh, as to who is a yogi. Because you cannot, you know, I mean, they've, they've been reciting the verses of the Siddha Pragya every, every day. Uh, every ashramic community member has by hearted these, uh, these verses and they're constantly thinking about. This what, is chapter 2. There's, yeah, so those verses on the Siddha Pragya, somebody who's secure, um, um, stayed fast in his intellect as, it, as the translation goes. And, and the word sometimes used for that is a yogi. And uh, so Gandhi is asked, who is a yogi? And I don't know what the Ashram community expected. And he says, the best example that I can think of a yogi is Jesus. The way he lived and the way he died was a life of a yogi. So I'm saying that Gandhi's reading of texts is not a unitary reading of text. It, it you know, it there's something else happening. Uh, why does he come away with the experience of ahimsa from it? Because he thinks that the most important thing there uh, in the entire text is not where the text is situated. 
of what the text is trying to tell you. What is the text trying to tell you? It's trying to tell you that you have to be a brahmachari. Because what he remembers of the Bhagavad Gita are those two verses. Right? The desire will lead to the solution of human mind and human effort. Right? So what one is required to do so the message there is that of harmony of all senses, mm. uh, of, of, of reigning in your desires from the objects of desire, oh. as, the, as the term goes. Harmony of senses rather than control over senses. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because the brahmacharya, the word brahmacharya... Yeah. Uh, uh, it's not about iron control. No, of course not. You see, I mean, actually, uh, even in Sanskrit, it does not mean celibacy. Mm. It means conduct that leads one to truth. Brahma Charya. Mm -hmm. Charya is conduct. Brahma is truth. Mm -hmm. And that's why Gandhi says these are my experiments with Brahma Charya. Mm -hmm. It's not about celibacy. Mm -hmm. One aspect of celibacy and a very restricted notion of Brahma Charya is celibacy. Mm -hmm. right? So Gandhi began with that restricted notion mm -hmm. but doesn't stay there. Mm -hmm. right? And so Gandhi's own practices enlarge. And so does the meaning of the term in large mm. uh, windows. Mm. So Br Brahmacharya is about harmony of senses. Mm. Mm. And, and from that he derives an ethics of ahimsa. That, that there he derives an ethics of ahimsa. Mm. Mm. Does that make it very difficult for less disciplined and less intense people to follow? No, not necessarily. Right? I mean, uh, for example, uh, I mean, do, do, do we say that uh, everybody who, who walked with him to Dandi mm -hmm. or anybody, everybody who was at Dharasana mm -hmm. uh, uh, at the salt works, right? uh, uh, not raising even their hands uh, in self-defense uh, because all the injury marks, we are told, were on the head and the shoulders and not on the fingers. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Um, so, which, which is just the medical kind of medical legal records of that period, which very very clearly show that people did not raise their hands to protect their skull. Now, were they all, you know, um, uh, complex thinkers the way Gandhi was? No, I think what Gandhi did uh, was that he also could generate within us, uh, or at least the people around him, um, the potential to be non-violent. Mm -hmm. We have potential to be non-violent and we have potential to be violent. And I think Gandhi unleashed mm -hmm. that potentiality of being non-violent. Mm -hmm. Just as for a very long time, uh, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan unleashed the potentiality to be non-violent among people who were violent and then after him turned one of the most violent regions in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the Northwest Frontier Province. Yeah. Yeah. But during the period that Khan Sahib is there, Bacha Khan, Bacha Khan unleashes the potential to be non-violent. Yeah. So Gandhi had that capacity of unleashing uh, mm. uh, aspects mm. among people. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, that was one. Second, he, he was also somebody who could teach non-violence. Mm. And that's important. Mm. He constantly taught non-violence. Mm. Um, um, every time a movement would start, he would send out these advisories through his journals mm. saying, you are required to do this. Mm. This is an expected behavior. Mm. 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 You are not required to do these things. Mm. Mm. This is not on. Mm. Not acceptable. Not acceptable. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Right? So, so it's, 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 he is training you to do that. Yeah. The ashram also becomes a kind of a space, a university mm. where uh, people uh, come and, and, and are trained into non-violence. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not an automatic thing. Yeah. Prison going is not automatic. Mm -hmm. He trained his body and mind to be in prison mm -hmm. as, as also the minds and bodies of a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. None of these, you know, um, none of these things are uh, purely instinct based. Mm -hmm. It requires training, it requires preparation, it requires undergoing mm -hmm. certain kind of self practices. Mm -hmm. Is this what inspired you to do your recently published uh, collection of Gandhi's writings on nonviolence and resistance? No, I, 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 you know, I, one has had this feeling for quite some time uh, that one 
we don't pay attention enough scholastic attention uh, to non-violence. Mm. We, uh, those of us or those of th those among us who are more um, have a greater predilection for action, also don't necessarily sit back and reflect on on non-violence. Also, non-violence has been reduced, I think, only to a pure virtue or an ethic. Uh, snapping its relationship with politics mm. and what I wanted to do was to remind our, ourselves mm. that non-violence is a political action mm. so the collection is called no, the power of non-violent resistance mm. resistant being resistance being as important mm. as non-violence mm. because non-violence as a personal ethic is one thing and non-violence as a political um, instrument is something else, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how are we? You know, yeah. so so uh, you and I can always be non-violent, mm. uh, so long as we are not faced with the might of a tyrant. That's right. right? Uh, that you and I can have a personal ethic which is non-violent, but we don't necessarily reflect as mm. to what structures of violence we we protect or we are part of. Mm -hmm. We need to actually see relationships uh, within the economic realm, within the social structures, within the political structures and also when um, we are faced with the might of a state or a tyrant and what is it that we do. Uh, it's very easy to valorize the virtues of non-violence uh, but um, yeah. The, the, the Your book comes out at a time when uh, there is, a, from recent past, an unprecedented upsurge of resistance by young people. Um, can you say how you would like them to read the book? If, if I mean, what are some of the key uh, takeaways that they can find in this collection one, of nonviolence writing? One, it's young women. <laughs> and they don't need to read the book. They are just amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? Uh, 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 I think uh, one has learned so much in the last three weeks, four weeks. Um, and one, what one is reminded constantly is the, uh, is the courage uh, of young women. But more than courage, um, dignity, grace in face of, of brutality. Because um, I think politics is also about Gandhi tells us, and so does Jesus, so does any great teacher, that politics is also about aesthetics. Your resistance has to be so beautiful, so sublime, that the tyrant is ashamed. Mm -hmm. And I think these young women and, and some young men, but largely young women, have shown us that it's, it's absolutely possible to do politics in a way that is aesthetically sublime. And I think, so So, so my, my great takeaway from then has been, um, finally, I think after many, many, many decades, uh, aesthetics and grace is back and dignity is back in, in our political culture mm -hmm. because of that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, because we had lost that. And you're saying this is actually more important than any learned nonviolence. Absolutely, because this is what nonviolence is about, that it is a beautiful kara. And Gandhi would use the word the art of nonviolence. I mean, that's the art of nonviolence. Yes, yes. That's the art of nonviolence. Is there, is it uh, incumbent in this ethic mm -hmm. to be able to uh, perceive and uh, imagine the other in even the tyrant mm. in potentially transformative ways that are we trying to uh, merely defeat the other or are we trying to win over the other? You know, um, let me ask the question, is it naive to write a letter to Hitler? The world is still asking that question. Right, and and, and, and therefore I uh, one section that I have in, in the book is called Letters to Hitler. Yeah. Right? And I pose this question, is it naive to write a letter to Hitler? Uh, I don't think it's naive. Uh, because politics um, and the kind of political action that the young women and men are doing today uh, is a supreme form of satyagraha. 
and the principle around which the idea of Satyagraha emerges uh, is that the other is not pure evil. If that is, if the other is pure evil, then Satyagraha is self annihilation. None of these people are self annihilating themselves. They are saying, "Hame dar nahi hai." It is not a fatalistic project. It's not a project which says, oh, we are going to be defeated eventually because we are dealing with pure evil or with such powerful forces that they cannot be transformed. Right? So the transformative potential has to be part of that resistance. And it is very much there in what everything that they do. In the songs they sing, uh, the josh that they have, mm. uh, uh, the joy that they have mm. uh, uh, in, in, in being together and being with each other mm. uh, and being there, uh, uh, caring for each other, mm. the, all of these, th there is a source of joy. So this is not a fatal, fatalistic endeavor. Mm. So I think whether they express themselves in those terms or not, there is hope mm. and, and, and there is hope of transformation. Mm. 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 You, you can't take... Um, that away from from yeah. us, yeah. Right? Uh, uh, and I think that's that's very very uh, yeah. uh, um, something which is really. Mm. And would it be fair to say that this kind of energy has manifested itself across the world mm. countless time in the last seventy years? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It's just that we've um, we're so overwhelmed with the images of violence. Mm. Uh, um, that we sometimes pay less and less attention to the images of non-violence mm. and the realities and the realities of non-violence. But what you know, uh, or, or that uh, um, that one could be stunned into silence mm. even by an image of non-violence, mm. mm. uh, or that one 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 uh, uh, is forced to pause and think mm. uh, as to what that spontaneous gesture of a young woman means or what that song mm. that she sings with full freedom mm. means or the act of caring for somebody means. Mm. Mm. Um, so uh, I think uh, yes I mean it, it has it's been there uh, all the time it's just sometimes we take it for granted uh, and when you take things for granted when you dis disuse things they can be misused uh, uh, so we've disused uh, non-violence sometimes uh, uh, not really paid enough attention to it, and, mm. Um, mm. and not not really paid attention to the politics of it, mm. the mm. power that it has to resist. Mm. Mm. So, before closing, uh, when by the time Gandhi is close to his end, he is personally very disappointed and heartbroken about how his experiment in nonviolence has turned out. But he, am I correct in thinking that he never wavers in his confidence in the concept and the ideal and its potential? Which is perhaps the darkest night of Gandhi's soul. Mm. Uh, um, and it's, 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 it's very biblical. Mm. On that one day, he questions everything. Mm -hmm. He questions Satyagraha, questions Ahimsa, and questions the Ashramic community. And when is this? This is in December of 1946, he's in Sri Lanka. Yeah. Um, and, 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 um, and all these years, and after that day again, he would say, am I, am I fit to be Ahimsa? Mm -hmm. That was always the case, uh, or am I a good Satyagrahi? Am I an Ashramite uh, in the ideal sense, or do I come close to the the ideal that I have in mind and his answer would always be no and, uh, one is never perfect in that case on that day he says are ahimsa do ahimsa and satyagra actually have qualities that I have ascribed to them so the so that darkness is is very much there um, and 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 uh, what brings this on I think the failure of the, the project of collective non-violence. Uh, see, Gandhi's endeavor, we forget, is not that we are individually capable of being non-violent and being 
mm-hmm. being satyagrahis, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. but we are collectively capable of being non-violent. Mm-hmm. And collective non-violence is a, is a different mm-hmm. project. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, and that is that endeavor which seems to be which which slept, you know, which 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 failed. Let's admit that you know the project of collective non-violence uh, in Gandhi's lifetime. Uh, um, in some ways, very large questions are posed to it um, by the kind of political violence and criminal violence that's unleashed uh, during between 1946 and 1948. It comes to an end, um, as it should, with his own assassination. Uh, but till that point, there is uh, a kind of makabar dance of death that the Indian subcontinent seems to enjoy, uh, which destroys uh, Gandhi. I mean, there is no doubt that he is deeply, deeply perturbed. Uh, not just deeply perturbed, he is shaken to the core uh, by what he sees around him. Yeah. But yet he towards the end, throughout his Prathna Pravachans yes. in 47, uh, he keeps reaffirming that the principle, the value, the ideal of ahimsa is not in question. Where does that faith come from? I don't know whether, whether that faith, where that source of that faith is. Right? Uh, is that source of faith in, uh, in a belief of truth as God or, or his capacity to pray um, um, to that abstract notion and submit to it. Is it coming from there? Is it coming from a deeper philosophical source which is as deep as the one of faith and prayer and therefore more reasoned source? I'm not so certain. I think it's a combination of both. That there is a philosophical conviction uh, on the necessity of non-violence mm-hmm. and there is a faith in non-violence which comes to him uh, through oh, his wow. own uh, mm-hmm. spiritual practices. Mm-hmm. So I, think, I I sense the combination of, of, mm-hmm. of the two. Uh, not always easy to, mm-hmm. to separate mm-hmm. uh, but it's there. But and also that non-violence as love or love is non-violence. Yeah, absolutely. Compassion. Mm-hmm. Caring. See, one aspect of Gandhi that we forget, and we have one aspect of all non-violent resistance that we forget, that there is a lot of caring which is required. Mm-hmm. At a very everyday level. At an everyday level. Mm-hmm. And it's an act of great uh, care. It's an act of giving. Uh, it's an act of uh, togetherness, mm-hmm. which not, violence never allows. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What non-violence allows is an act of togetherness. Mm-hmm. Violence can only allow you regimentation. Mm-hmm. Or the illusion of, of a mob, of, of, a, of togetherness but, in a mob. No, right, but, but um, what you call um, um, together with, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is where from the word the root of the word seva comes in. Really? Yeah. Saha eva, together with. Right? So I, 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 I always think uh, that, uh, well, I think that the, the best uh, uh, synonym for non violence is seva. Not love. Not love. I mean, along with love, but the same. Well, love is a connector. Yes, it's a connector. Uh, or, or the best, um, if I had to find uh, antonyms for, or the opposite, for violence it would be seva. Because to, to, to be together with, if you're together with, there is no possibility of violence. Okay. Thank you so much.